19th century revolvers are some of the most iconic and collectible antique firearms you can find. You know, you've got the Colt single action army, the Colt percussion revolvers, the Walker, you've got the Smith and Wesson revolvers all the way from the 1850s through the end of the century. You've got Remington's innovative revolvers during the Civil War and beyond. But what we often forget about are the iconic revolving long guns of the 19th century. Revolving long guns evolved from the beginning of the century all the way through the late 19th century. We have an incredible selection of literally dozens revolving rifles and shotguns in the upcoming August Premier Firearms Auction. I wanted to show you basically all of them, but that would take hours. So we'd be sitting here watching a documentary length film, if not longer, of me just nerding out about guns. So instead, what I've done today is I've selected some of my favorites representing the early 19th century, moving into the 1830s and 1840s, some of the mid 19th century designs, and then some of the post-Civil War designs. The first two we have before me are two of the earliest examples in the auction and two of the most iconic. So we've got a Artemis Wheeler revolving rifle at the back, and then in the front, we've got a Collier smoothbore carbine and these two guns, as you can see, are very related. So the rifle at the back is the Artemis Wheeler design. These were manufactured in the United States. And this example is actually the only rifle out of a group of four Wheeler long guns purchased by the US Navy for $100 a piece in 1821. The rifle is in 50 caliber, and you can see why the US Navy would be interested in something like this. Instead of a single shot blunderbuss or a single shot musket, you've got you know, multiple rounds that can be fired off in quick succession without having to reload. So I mentioned that this is the only rifle from that group of four manufactured for the US Navy trials. It is also the only one of those four guns that remains in private hands. So this is an incredibly rare opportunity to get your hands on a piece of American firearms history. And you know, two of the other examples are in the Smithsonian. That gives you an idea of how important these early Wheeler patent revolving long guns are. So the example at the front, which I'm actually going to pick up so I can show you guys a little more of the details on it, is Collier's improvement on Wheeler's design. Collier is also an American, but he patented this design in the UK and these were manufactured in the UK. And if you take a look, this one's a pretty special one. This is serial number nine, so it's a very early example of a Collier. Many of the Colliers are actually revolving handguns, so they kind of can be seen as the predecessors of Colt's revolvers. In fact, Collier's designs were brought up during patent trials by Samuel Colt. So you can see how important that is for American firearms history. Um, what's really cool about this one is it's actually a smooth bore. It's got a slightly flared muzzle, kind of like a blunderbuss. And it was basically designed as a coach gun. We've actually seen documents showing that Collier was actually advertising a revolving carbine design plus a pair of his pistols and trying to sell them to the Royal Mail as, you know, defense against highwaymen in the period. And you can see again, just like the Navy trials version, why something like this would be appealing for defending a mail coach. Often those guys would be armed with blunderbusses and pistols. If you had a Collier carbine and a pair of Collier revolvers, that allows you to have much more firepower. So if you're facing multiple opponents, you can get shots off more rapidly and still defend yourself. On top of that, what's really cool about this one is it actually has a folding snap bayonet like a lot of the blunderbusses. So if I pull this switch and you take a look, the bayonet's gonna snap out in place and it locks in place automatically. So that gives you another backup. Let's say you fired off all these shots or you're just trying to keep somebody back and you don't wanna actually have to shoot them. You can put a bayonet out as a last line of defense. The bayonet just comes down here and it folds in place. There's a little switch here and this is what locks it in place on this stud at the muzzle. Another interesting aspect of the Collier and the Wheeler is they both use different versions of primer magazines. If you take a look at the top of the frizzen here, there's a opening that slides open and closed. And that allows you to fill this with powder. And as you open and close the frizzen, this little arm here pushes against a you know, cog or gear on the side and that rotates, dropping a pre-measured amount of powder into the pan. So you don't have to reprime after each shot either. So again, speeding up the rate of fire. Another interesting aspect is on the collier, if you pull back the cylinder to rotate. So the front of the cylinder actually locks in place over the breech end of the barrel, creating a better gas seal. Gas seals was a major problem in early breech loading firearms. A lot of them had serious gas leak, which could burn the user, 
you know, you're losing power when you have gas leak. And it also, with black powder, is gonna cause fouling to build up in the mechanism. So by having the cylinder fit over the breech end of the barrel, that helps relieve some of that problem. Another interesting aspect of this particular example, because you've got the bayonet underneath the muzzle, they need to find a place to put the ramrod. So what they've done is actually fit it into the buttstock here in the toe of the stock. So a nice, you know, pretty ingenious solution to storing the ramrod while still allowing you to mount a snap bayonet and keeping the bayonet under the barrel where it's out of the line of sight so you can actually still aim. These are just two of the selection of revolving flintlocks in the upcoming sale. These are two of my favorites and two of the most historic, so I'm going to show these off to you. Now we're going to move forward just a little bit in time and talk about the 1830s. In the 1830s, you get some newer revolving rifle designs. We have a bunch of examples of the Miller patent, which we have previously covered in other videos, so I'm not going to show those off today. Those are kind of similar to the Collier in that they have a more traditional revolving cylinder that's manually revolved. But in the 1830s, you also get the turret rifle design. So the example here at the back is a Cochrane turret rifle. These were manufactured around the 1830s. And this example is manufactured by C.B. Allen. As you can see, the main difference visually when you look at one of these revolving turret rifles is that there is a cylinder with the shots aimed outwards. So instead of everything being aimed forward like a traditional revolving rifle or handgun, you've got a horizontal revolving cylinder in this example with the chambers all facing outwards. That leaves a few problems. So it causes some of these chambers to be faced outwards, obviously, which is a risk if there was chain fire, including some being faced potentially towards the actual shooter themselves. So that can be a risk. I don't really know if there's very many actual examples from the time period of negligent discharges causing you know, actual deaths and injuries, um, but it is definitely something people have talked about and something that people have said would definitely have been a risk, and you can see why. On the Cochrane design, you've got a little latch here on top. You push this little button ahead of the rear sight, you can push that up, and then you can rotate the cylinder to the next shot. That'll then drop into these little divots that are aligned for each chamber. To reload, you can actually turn the rear sight and then lift this up. Then you can pull the whole piece off. So you can see when it's off, all the percussion nipples aligned along the bottom. The brass piece here in the middle kind of shields the nipple, so it should help limit the risk from chain fires. And then you can drop that back in place after it's been reloaded. Turn that back in and everything's latched. For the Cochrane design, you actually have an under hammer mechanism. So you pull this down. The hammer actually has spring pressure and then latches onto the actual trigger. And when you pull the trigger, it directly releases the hammer, which strikes one of those. So you can see with the Cochrane design, it's an innovative way to get multiple shots out of what still looks, generally, if you ignore this section, like a traditional muzzle loading rifle. So in addition to horizontally oriented turret rifles, they also made vertically oriented turret rifles. The most famous version of that is P.W. Porter's design, which was patented in 1851. If you take a look at Flaterman's Guide to Antique American Firearms and some of the other classic references to 19th century firearms, what you're going to see is that there's a few variations, you know, a few standard variations of the Porter listed. But what we've actually found over the years of selling these guns is there's actually a lot of other smaller sub-variants that are even rarer than those more standardized examples. This example here is actually serialized number 22, and it is 38 caliber, whereas most porters are listed as 44 caliber. In addition to this one, we've also got a 52 caliber version in the sale and a 15 bore shotgun. So that kind of shows you some more variety than what you often see listed in the references. And the porter design is really neat. So when you look at it, you've got a revolving turret, pretty similar to the Cochrane, but it's twisted upright. Again, to keep the hammer out of the line of sight, you've actually got it on the side. It's a side hammer, also known as a mule ear. That's built into this lock mechanism that covers this whole left side. One of the variations on this example that is different than most is this latch right here. So if you lift this latch up, that allows you to rotate the entire fire mechanism out. This latch is 
quite a bit different than what you're going to see on the standard designs. They all do basically the same purpose, but this one's designed a little bit differently, which shows you they were kind of experimenting as they were getting into production of these really interesting and innovative firearms. Like the Cochrane, you can actually just take this and slide it right out. There were examples that came with multiple turrets, so you could swap out and get multiple shots really quick. So in addition to this interesting lock mechanism that opens sideways and allows you to get access both to the internal mechanism and the turret for removal and reloading, the Porter design is actually pretty cool because it uses a lever, much like the levers you're gonna see on later 19th century lever actions. And when you run the lever, it's gonna cock the hammer out and it's gonna rotate the turret. So if you watch, as I rotate this forward, it's gonna bring the turret in line with the bore. Like the Cochrane design with the Porter, you've again got the risk of the chambers not being pointed all down range. But most of them are aimed kind of up and away or down and away. So as long as your hand was back, if you had a negligent discharge where it created a chain fire, you shouldn't have you know, a catastrophic result of these balls coming back and killing the shooter. They could definitely still injure somebody and could definitely injure the shooter depending on what happened. But again, there's not a lot of evidence that these were real problems in the time period. One of the other innovative aspects of the Porter design is that it has a built-in priming mechanism. So you can see right here, this is actually a primer magazine that holds percussion caps. And these are fed over top of the hole here that the hammer strikes through and then smashed against the side of the turret aligning with the flash holes. So that sometimes causes confusion and people think they're pill primed. They did use percussion caps, but you can kind of see how that builds off of the earlier technology. You know, you had the Wheeler and the Collier had onboard automatic priming mechanisms. That allows you to shoot a muzzle loading revolving firearm faster than if you end up cap each time you were gonna shoot this revolving rifle. So these two kind of represent the second wave of American revolving firearms. You've got the turret rifle designs. And as I mentioned, we've also got examples of the Miller patent, which is also manufactured by Billinghurst and others in the sale. And so this kind of represents the 1830s, 1850s, the antebellum era leading up to the American Civil War. What I really wanna show you next is probably one of the strangest revolving firearms designs I've ever seen. And if you told me that we were gonna have dozens of revolving long guns in a sale, including flintlocks, and one of the flintlocks wasn't gonna be my favorite, I probably wouldn't believe you until I saw this thing before me. So what you've got right here is one of the rarest firearms you can find. There's only maybe a handful of these known in existence. You know, some sources are gonna tell you there's only three. This one makes four. There might be one or two more out there hiding somewhere, but there's only really four that are really known. And this example is by far the nicest it's also the only one that comes with a case and a full set of accessories. And it's also the only one that I'm aware of that actually is documented to a specific person. So this example was owned by a British doctor who served in a volunteer rifle corps in 1861. So kind of right into the American Civil War era, you know, coming off the Crimean War. These were patented by Thomas W.G. Treby in 1855. And it kind of has a whole new approach to a multi-shot revolving firearm. So you take a look at the Treby design, which you're rarely going to get any opportunity to even see one of these. If you take a look at it, you basically got, instead of a revolving cylinder or a turret, you've got a series of chambers linked together, basically like a bike chain. So you can see it even kind of rattles kind of like a bike chain. And that keeps the individual chambers separate from one another as they revolve around a central axis. One of the other things that does is it allows the option to modify this design to take a bigger chain to allow a large number of shots. This example is 54 caliber, so pretty standard, you know, right in the military caliber range for the time period. And given that it's inscribed to a doctor who was in the volunteer rifle corps, you can see that he probably intended to use this on the battlefield. Um, it's not entirely clear exactly when he bought it. We know he was listed in some of the records in 1861, but he may have been in the volunteers during the 1850s as well during the Crimean War. So the idea that you could see one of these in the battlefield is pretty exciting. If you take a look at the breech end of the barrel, you can see another one of the fascinating intricacies of the design of the treaty. So you've got threads rotating this way, and then you've got threads coming another direction here at the back. That is because, like the Collier, the Treby has an onboard gas seal kind of built into the design. The front of these chambers is slightly chamfered so that it locks into the breech end of the barrel. 
when you rotate the lever up and around, you can see that it moves the barrel forward using these threads. So that unlocks these chambers at the back. So the chamber that was lined up with the barrel would have been locked in place with the barrel back. Now that it's forward, I can pull the hammer and it's gonna automatically advance to the next shot. Then I just grab this, close it up. Now you've got a, what should be a nice tight seal here at the back. You can pull the trigger, fire, open the lever, pull the hammer back in advance. So you can shoot pretty quickly. You can imagine if you had, you know, say a team of guys armed with treebies and maybe they had some reloaders available as well, that they could fire off really quickly, pass this gun back to the reloader who could reload the chain fairly quickly and then pass it back to the shooter, you could get a pretty significant amount of firepower. And again, an era that's still dominated on the battlefield by single shot rifle muskets. Something like the Treebee would have offered significant firepower to a smaller group of men if needed, or a, you know, a specialized skirmishing unit. You can see there's different applications, but unfortunately for the Treebee, it was never really adopted and widely used. As I mentioned it towards the beginning of this section, this is an incredibly rare example. There's very, very few of these Treebees in existence. And if you take a look, this one is by far the nicest one you're gonna find. So you've got kind of beautiful, just nicely aged, finish along the whole gun. You've still got a fair amount of finish remaining. And then you've also got, you know, nice and crisp English scroll engraving. When you flip it over here on the side plate, you've got the patent information inscribed. You've got this really nice silver escutcheon back here inscribed with the abbreviation for the doctor's unit and his initials. And then you've got a pretty nice buttstock with crisp checkering. I mean, overall, just an absolutely beautiful and stunning, you know, revolving rifle design, unlike anything you're ever going to see. I mean, if you saw this gun outside of this context, you probably would assume it's some sort of, you know, like I said, steampunk or sci-fi design but this is a real firearms design from the 1850s. And this one and others show signs they were actually used in the time period. So that is why this is one of my favorite guns in the entire sale. For our last example, we're gonna move on into the Civil War and beyond into the cartridge era. So what we've got right here is a Lamat combination revolving rifle and shotgun. Oftentimes these are just referred to as Lamat carbines. This is based on Lamatt's design patented back in 1856, so just following the Treby, and they were most famously manufactured as percussion revolving handguns used by the Confederacy during the American Civil War. We've actually got two examples of those in the sale, as well as this incredible revolving carbine, like I said, combination rifle shotgun, depending on how you want to name it. So in addition to the actual Lamatts in the sale, we also have a Billinghurst based on the Miller patent that's pretty similar to the Lamat that also has a rifled barrel and an underbarrel shotgun. If you take a look at the centerfire Lamat, there was actually patents that improved the original Lamat design that Lamat patented in Europe. You can see that it's basically the same overall basic mechanism as the standard percussion Lamats, but they modified the design a little bit to accept centerfire cartridges. So one of the most obvious Modifications is you need to be able to load it from the breech. So if you look right here, you can flip this up. That gives you access to the back of the shotgun barrel. And there is a loading gate down here to load the main cylinder. So that would make this mechanism even faster to reload and use in, in battle than the original percussion Lamats that would actually have to be loaded from the front. Like the original Lamats, you've got a selector switch here on the hammer. Put it down like this, you're gonna hit the striker for the shotgun barrel. If you pull it back and switch it up, that clears this out of the way so it doesn't hit this. And instead you're gonna have the firing pin hit one of the chambers for the cylinder. I selected the Lamat to basically represent this transitional period. You know, in the 1860s, you've got percussion revolving firearms being used in the American Civil War, including Lamats and, you know, the Colt revolving rifles. And then after the Civil War, they start modifying some of these designs to take metallic cartridges. So you've got the Lamat here in center fire. We've got an example of a Remington revolving rifle modified to take rimfire cartridges. And then you also have designs like the Roper repeating shotguns and repeating rifles with revolving cylinders. But ultimately these were all supplanted by what we all think of when we think of center fire firearms from the late 19th century. You think of 
bolt action rifles, and lever action rifles. And there's a pretty simple reason. In addition to the gas leak and some of the other problems we discussed with some of the earlier designs, there's just a problem you're gonna have with any revolving rifle. One is just the gas seal in general, but also the fact that when you have a revolving rifle, where do you put your hand? If you put your hand here, you're gonna have hot gases and shreds of lead hitting you in the hand. If you have a chain fire, you're taking multiple shots into your hand. The Lamat kind of tried to fix that design. You can see this on some of the other revolving rifles as well. What they did was they placed a flat front on the trigger guard so you could actually hold the rifle like this, which keeps your hand back and away from the cylinder. But it's not really ideal. Nobody really holds their guns this way very often. Most people want to hold their hands out here, which was problematic. With the lever action and a bolt action rifle, that's not a problem. And over time, those designs proved more robust, more reliable, and the better options going forward. So we've taken a journey through the 19th century. We started back in the 18 teens, moving through the 1830s, 1850s, into the cartridge era of the late 19th century, showing just a few of the very many examples we have of revolving rifles and shotguns in the upcoming August premiere auction. I highly encourage you to check out our blog as well as the catalog to see a lot of other examples. We've got some other really strange and interesting designs represented from throughout that same time period. And this is just a small selection of some of my favorites representing each of those eras.